Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to join this session. I am Mary Wong, Director of Open Source Ecosystem for Volvo Cars. Uh, I'm based in Sweden, uh, Gothenburg city. So today I'm going to share with you about our Osborne journey and uh, how open source is, is developing Volvo Cars. When I come here, it's interesting. I haven't found any, not that much, Volvo cars on the street. I wonder why. Um, as you know, safety is our core, right? So in 1959, um, the three-point three seat belt in 1959 it's made by one of the Volvo's engineering. And at that time, they think it's valuable to save people's life. So we made it as patent free. This is an open source conception. So it is not far from today, you see, it's like open source software, but this, we can say this is use the same terminology or conception of the open source. So you do not keep yourself, you make it open source. It will save all of people's life. So, how many of you have Osborne in your company? Okay, about one third. Great. So, for you already have Osborne, bear with me because I still will talk about how we form our Osborne to the left audience. Hopefully, it is okay. Um, we have formed the Osborne in 2023. So, so far, it's like one year and 10 months. So I would like to share with you about when you start to form your Osborne or when you are on your journey to form your Osborne, what is kind of important for you, how you can make it smoothly and convince the managers easier. Because this is when I drive this at the beginning, I have no idea about this big area. I only start with the compliance part. That is uh, easier for me, it's like, IP legal requirement, right? There's no argument, yes or no, that is a must. So I took this story about the horsepower called top down or bottom up. So I think some Osborne start from bottom up, some Osborne from top down. And uh, no good or bad, I mean, once you can make it, it, once it works, it's fine, right? It's not like this is correct or that is wrong. So it depends on the initiate, where they're from. So bottom up is when you know how it works, because you know in this implementation part, but you might don't know the goal, where it is. So you don't know where you want, right? You are in your areas, like boom, 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 like coding or engineers. Um, that's quite dangerous as well because you cannot see the overall picture about the open source area in a company. After all, it is a huge topic and it is for the co whole corporation level. It's not for a team or two teams or 10 teams, it's for the whole company. I mean, if your company is like have 10,000 of employees, so that must be quite difficult. <clears throat> but top down also the same. When you know what you want, you are clearly where we will go. <coughs> but you don't know how it works in detail level, in implementation level. You see, the bug comes. Um, if you don't know how it works, even though you have the clear goal, it's still very difficult to kind of um, have the output there. You only have a, a kind of conception there, oh, this is where we want to go. But how to do there? What do you need to break down to go there? You don't know. The worst case is you don't know what you are going to go and you don't know how it works. So if the initiate in this situation, I think it's more challengeable than in the other two uh, scenarios. So, we need to move to a wanted state. We need to know where we are going and we need to know how it works. 
That's why we are here. Learn from the community, the, fun, the open source community or foundations. This gives us a lot of help and uh, guidance to help each other to grow. <clears throat> from our case, I came from engineering part, so it belong to this bottom-up role um, type. Um, it's not easy. It takes us about one year to form the Osborne officially. So, still, since it's from bottom up, you need to convince each layers of manager until the C levels managers, and then you decide to form the also when you find the resource and the, the why, right? Um, but we did it um, last year, and it works so far. Um, and I think we know clearly where we are going to go. So th this is a case study for you. I think maybe it's not applied for all of you, but you can learn or borrow this use case in your areas. <coughs> so this is our Osborne journey so far. As I mentioned, we have formed the Osborne in 2022 uh, officially, and before that we I and other people drive this open source um, council, I call it, as a hobby project. Um, kind of try to spread it in the whole company to make the awareness, etc. <clears throat> Some milestones happening in this year. Uh, in the April, we have adopted open chain license compliance, which is we find three critical projects which include Linux in it and try to follow all the standards and do the compliance work. And we are working uh, on the join this COVISA uh, foundation this year as well at the same time. So our Osborne is driving the open source compliance, open source contribution, and open source collaboration almost at the same time. Uh, we have four people in our team, different people focus on different areas, but we collaborate a lot since we are quite few people. So we swift our strengths transfer from one area to another. <clears throat> so this is our method in a nutshell. Uh, I think this is probably the, quite similar to all of you who run this Osborne and focus on the fundamental stuff. Usually it's same to AI, same to your CI, same to your any kind of other organization, you always have a high level standard, let's say, or high level requirement. Then you build your internally, let's say, um, open source directive from your IP legal. That is the internal law. Every team in this company need to follow it. Of course, to build the awareness is very important. No matter how perfect your Osborne is, if people don't know it, don't know your team, how, how they know this open source area. So first, the open source culture is very important at the beginning. Build the open source fundamental directive, process, automation, etc. Once that is in place, of course, when you build it, you need to talk to the development team if that is good or bad. I mean, if your process is, takes a lot of admin work, that will be a disaster for engineering. They will hate you, they won't do it anyway. So automation is very important in this case. Getting up managers engaged and support. This is, in this case, after you formed the Osborne, there is still a lot of approach here. I, for the implementation part, how do you drive this? Bottom up or top down? We use both, because if we only talk to the engineers, they won't do it, because there's no task from up, from managers, right? Or from product owners. But if you only talk to the high levels, the engineers don't know this. So we communicate with different layers. So engineers, the product owners, and the managers. So these three parts, people need to be engaged. So that means everyone is aligned and agreed and handshaked with this task. 
clarify the open source accountability with each product manager. This requirement need have a central requirement from Osborne need to put in each PM's backlog. So this is knowing and have plan when they will implement it. Once all of this is done, it's just ex execute. But as you know, when you, if your company have a product like our company have a car to sell, right? You always put the car product related features as the highest pri priority. Others is like, wait, wait, wait. So that's why it usually takes much longer time for a big company to execute for these non-product related areas. That is a challenge <clears throat> for all, I think. So this is our internal portal. I think every company probably have it also. Uh, you need to have a central place for all open source related activities and uh, all make it simple to find, easy to find for your engineers. <clears throat> so if you got questions more than five times, you need to think about it. Why, right? How to improve it? How to release your own time to, to kind of, if you get the same questions more than five times, you need to think about it, how to improve it. Unless you like the duplicate questions day after day. <clears throat> so here it's very important in our company because Osborne as a central organization which governs open source related activities, it's quite a small team. But how can you manage to talk with so many development team in a company, global site? So we introduced the one specific role here called open source champion. We learned it from Amazon company um, last year, I think. So this is like a glue, kind of a bridge to connect Osborne and uh, each development unit. It's very important. Their responsibility is much higher than the Osborne effect. They are the execute, they are the bridge, they communicate, they make things done, even though they don't own the accountability if something happened. But their work is make it done and uh, it escalate if uh, there are any kind of difficulty in their team. So we bring this together to OSPO and Open Source Champion weekly to discuss both from uh, technical part and from driving or leadership part. <clears throat> This is how we force open source culture. If you can see here, it's all about training. I think training is very important, especially if you start the Osborne your company from scratch almost. How you train these thousands of thousands of people to know open source area, it's not an easy task. So firstly, the first one, we introduce a short video, which is only four minutes. Four minutes open source video which is engaged with three people there, two head of engineering, that means the head of R&D, and the head of digitalization, and the head of OSPO. So this four minutes video is spread in the whole company with all white collar employee. It is mandatory, no one can escape from it, including CEO. Because if you don't do it, the system, the system will continuously remind you until you are done. If you have a manager, it will cc to your manager if you haven't done this training. I don't know how it works for CEO because CEO don't have a manager. So I don't know if our CEO have done this or not. <laughs> but this is how the system works. If it's set mandatory for all white collar employee, it will be recursively chasing you until you are finished. And there are statistics, statistics as well. So how many employee has done this um, training? Because we think about so many employee is not work for the software area, right? They might work for this hardware or they might work for this mechanics, but it doesn't matter, four minutes, it doesn't hurt even though you are not working on this area. And a four minutes open source video is talking about a very general. So know this concept, 
No, if something happened, who you are going to go? That is Osborne. So it's, it's also a kind of project for Osborne in, in, within the whole company. And uh, after we launched the open source video, I received a lot of contacts from different areas, from factory, from the manufacturing, from the marketing, from the product strategy. So it is a very good uh, uh, influence, I would say, in this part. I don't know how many of you have this similar video in your company. Great, Sony have that. So learn from Sony. <laughs> it's key important. Otherwise, it's, you need to take more energy and time to, to get this information to all the employee or teams. <clears throat> so beside of the four minutes, then the long one comes, the second one. E-learning course, it lasts like 45 minutes. That is not mentory for everyone, but it is mentory for all software engineering. Because that is a little bit um, in detail part for this copyright and the contribution and collaboration aspects. And also we have open source software training for engineers and open source training for leaders, which is a live training. We run it every six weeks cadence. So if people want to come to the room or the teams, so we run it like this. By running all of these four uh, channels, I think today, I, I cannot say everyone knows open source, but it's a big difference compared to before. <clears throat> So this is the result. Without the result or output in place, no matter how good you convince your manager, how good you run your training, it doesn't mean anything. So for Osborne, what is your open source uh, component information in your car? This is our uh, latest car, EX90. I don't know if you know this one. Um, definitely, I think I cannot see it in Japan. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is uh, one of our, um, how to say, result from this latest uh, car. We are doing the same for our car model, or for all car models. <clears throat> this is not for all. This is for uh, most of the Android part and the infotainment system part. For the propulsion part and all other parts, it's on in our internal system. So we are working on to gather everything together to put it in the website uh, soon. <clears throat> we still have a lot of challenges as well as all of you. I think globally there are only five companies are doing 100%, kind of 100% compliance part. So we still have a lot of challenges. For example, the open source champions, the role also changes because that is not a fixed role, that is a virtual role, usually it's from developer or software architecture. So we need to keep on training them as well. Um, so addressing the priority between the product development and the open source compliance is always a issue because once you have the deadline for the product, you always need to put time there, otherwise, you don't have a product, uh, that's not allowed in a company, then you don't have anything to sell, right? And the third one is about different teams have different open source maturity level, including suppliers. Some suppliers are quite advanced, some suppliers I even don't know what is open source. So how you train the supplier and guide the supplier, that is also quite a big challenge. So that's why we have this, uh, uh, I mean, why this open source community have a lot. The Europe CRA uh, will come soon. That will force all commercial company will have this uh, SBOM in place, for example. <clears throat> open source contribution. So besides of the compliance part, open source contribution is very key, important in a company. Um, that is in the maturity level, let's say, too. But be before you get this open source compliance in place, you, 
it's very difficult for you to know how many open source are used in your company. Without the data in place, how do you know how many open source components are used in your company? You cannot ask one by one. It will take years, and it's not accurate. That's one of the part of our awesome is working on, to have the access for all projects in the company. And we can monitor all the license part. We can monitor how many open source components are used many times by different projects. With the data in place, it's easier for you to think out how many open source um, components you are heavily relying on. And next step is how you can help this open source, how you can help this development team to contribute to this open source in the community. It will save a lot of engineers' time instead of each team maintain their own open source project. For example, we have three development teams using Yocto project. And before we discovered that, each team have their own repo, have their own contribution, have their own maintain, everything. They don't talk to each other, even in the same organization, the big organization. But when we discovered from the open source council meeting, let's three, these three teams merge together. To, it's kind of in a source way, but it will be very efficient for these three teams to talk to each other and uh, doing this bug fix together and have like one stream to maintain this open source project. And also, one key important is how you make this open source contribution process easily. For example, you need to have this compliance check and security check, patent check, IP check, and export control check. With all of these people are in place when you have an open source project request. We take one week or one month or three months for this project can be released in your GitHub. That's very key, important. Usually the engineer don't have that much patience if they wait so long. Okay, I give up. I will use my private GitHub account to, to do this contribution, right? So that, that's the case. Try to avoid this, to avoid your IP leakage. Try to help the development teams the efficiency way. Get all of these people together in one or two meetings, each one, each row doing their um, decision there and merge together. So usually it takes one to two weeks for us to release the open source projects today. This is our development portal, our open source projects. So far we think we have, uh, how many we have today? Uh, yeah, 32 repos, some of are forked, but mostly half of them are focused on the tooling and some half of them are focused on the product. This is not any yet. There's the next step. How you roll out this open source project to the community? You don't just throw it in the GitHub saying, okay, it's ending, right? No, it's not like that. So the next step is even more changeable and we are working on that too is how you kind of marketing that and how you attract people to contribute to your open source project. <clears throat> so, in the open source contribution part, uh, security check seems much more than the compliance check, license compliance check, because security plays a big role here for example, we set, we require them to set up the security policy for open source project in the GitHub. And we turn on this uh, dependent check and we also require them to check this uh, token and uh, um, all the security related uh, items. And also we are trying to convince engineers to use this OpenSSF budget badge to measure how good you are. It's not a mandatory yet, but we are going to do it soon. So we need to make sure all of the open source project in our GitHub has no issues for license compliance, has no issues for security compliance. And it must be continuously uh, done 
I mean, not just do it one time before you release. So the last part is communication and collaboration. As I said, besides of the compliance and the contribution, the collaboration is very important. This is what happened in the past one and a half year in our company or in this community. As I said, we have adopted the open chain compliance in the April of this year, and also we joined the Covisa Foundation this year as well. We hosted the open source summit, or not open source summit, sorry, the Garrett summit, and we hosted the open infra summit in the headquarters of Overcars, and we have a lot of Linux conference uh, in Lund, and also we have hold the two eyes, I think, the ELISA project in Lund as well. I saw the ELISA people there, Philip. <laughs> so, um, and just before I come, we host the Eclipse SDV as well, software defined vehicle, um, to discuss how we engaged with these projects internally. And in last month, uh, you can see that um, Mercedes-Benz Volvo cars and Toyota, we had an automotive panel talk there. Anderson is not here. <laughs> oh, you're here, okay. <laughs> so there's almost no place here, so I hide Anderson for half here. <laughs> yeah, this is what happened. And also we joined the Ospology events in Marmo, uh, Sweden this year as well from I IKEA Hosted. And after this conference, I, when I go back, we have a Sweden, Swedish OSPO network event, similar to you have a lot of Japan open source event as well. So yeah, it's quite interesting. And also we have the AI part as well, AI compliance. Uh, one of our OSPO team members, Zoran, he also works for the AI committee in our company. And this is also a kind of mindset, how, how your OSPON works with a different open source platform. For example, the Linux part, cloud part, the AI part, the DevOps part. Is that all of these areas, people are in your OSPON or not? Is that virtually line, dot lined to OSPON or how you build these connections in a company? It's quite a difference between companies to companies. If your OSPO is big enough, have all of these areas. <clears throat> that would be great. I think that the efficiency, you always get together together and uh, spread this information to the whole organization. But if it's not, maybe it take more time. Uh, if you have a Linux main participant or cloud main participant <coughs> and uh, the CI part in your OSPO, it will be quite great. But usually it's very difficult to form this. So open source is not only about code, culture, and compliance. Open source is about business. That's the core, right? I mean, I, I don't say compliance is not important. That is important. That is the best. But in the end, it's about business. So oh, dollar, dollar here. <laughs> so how, <clears throat> how you can make it as open source or as a business in your company? Uh, I think we're not there yet. Many of you probably are not there yet. So that's our common goal. And we, with, with our goal, and we learn and we share. So, and we can think out soon for this part. So how to measure the key results for your open source, compliance, contribution, and collaboration? no matter which method you use. And in the end, you will also have the data in place, you visualize it, you visualize this to your uh, managers or C-level people, how much you saved for your company, how much you cost for your, from your company, how much uh, benefit you get from your company. Um, for example, we use the OKR model, um, that is called the object key result model. So for each area, you always have a measure or measure way to kind of how to visualize. This is called data-driven uh, transparent as well. 
So without the data in place, just talking, for example, if I talk to the development team, are you compliant? Are you compliant? Uh, yes, okay, I mark it green. Oh no, I mark it uh, red. It doesn't work because that is not data-driven transparent. I need to have your data in the system to see if it's compliant or not, not just to talk with you. <clears throat> so different method in different companies, some use KPI, some use OKR, it, or it doesn't matter, some with use talking or some use the data. In the end, you need to visualize this to all the company. Great. Um, yeah, this is what I have today. Let's embrace of open source together. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Yeah, A speaker. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have one question. And uh, regarding to the OSS champion, is it a role or some position or title? It's a role with responsibilities mm -hmm. and no title and uh, no fixed position. So these people usually are either developer or software architecture. Um, the responsibility for this role is like, for example, if I divide the car to infotainment system, propulsion, um, safety, or ADAS, I take the in infotainment as an example. In the inf infotainment system, you probably have different big teams, and then you have a 10 of 20 small teams. So it depends on how this organization um, organized, you have one or more open source champions to cover these areas. This is like a part-time job, I would say. But this role is exist. I mean, not a role, I mean, this role exists if someone changes the work and you need to find another one to replace it because the responsibility is here, never change. And this need to align with the managers. You always need a people here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was very insightful. I have two questions, if if I may. Yeah. Awesome. Sure. So, uh, yeah, for the training, first of all, I think it's extremely important. And one of my questions is uh, regarding the the upper management, let's say, because you discussed about training for for developers and for lawyers, which is very important as well. But I think what I, what I see in companies at least uh, the ones that I have worked until now, there is a lack of, of knowledge also in the management level. Yes. And how do you, how do you uh, approach this? Because uh, like, many decisions have to be taken by people that do not know anything about open source. So how, how do you deal with this? Yes, for the managers, I usually, you know, all the managers' schedule is quite tight. I usually start from the head, head level of each big department, head of connectivity, head of safety, <clears throat> I only use their 15 to 20 minutes. I, I cannot book them one hour because they have weekly or bi-weekly this uh, with their managers. You know, if I divide from CEO to bottom, it might be like at least five layers, right? So how you get these five layers manager involved? It's very difficult. I use from the top. Top, then you've got this top two levels, right? Then I, from the PO level, PO is product manager or product owner in this case, and then developers. So I, from these two part, and then the middle part is still uh, unknown, but the managers will kind of spread this information to their sub-managers, sub-managers, yeah. Uh, and one more question, thank you. Uh, so I, I, I think 
I, I, I think that everyone is kind of struggling right now with uh, AI and how this uh, interlinks with open source. So do you have a, a way that you are dealing with the AI issues in your OSPO? Or how like is the OSPO involved and how in, in the AI question? Mm. Yes, as I said, we have a one guy in our OSPO, which is also in the AI committee. And the AI committee is like you have this, uh, it's similar to OSPO, pre-OSPO. Before we formed the OSPO, we have the open source council. It's like all the volunteers meet together every week and to discuss, have a roadmap stuff, you make the directives. So we have an AI policy in our company. We have the AI use case. And <coughs> in which area you are allowed to use and in which area you are not. And we have formed the AI work group, which is a decision maker. And if any teams want to apply for AI usage, they go to this team to measure why use case and this. So they analyze and make decision together. So even though it's not an official team organization, but it works. I think many companies open source team are similar to this as well. Yeah, yeah, and an ad hoc team, kind of. Yes. Great, thank you so much. So as you say, you're still in the process and finding enough champions on the open source side, and I guess especially in the automotive industry, as you say, it's really hard to find those which are doing an OSS championships, because if you just go on plain open source consultings or so, or just look in the plain open source world, they may not understand the specifics of automotive. So my question is here, are you planning to go a training step or you would like to convince open source champions from outside to join Volvo as coming in a very regulated environment where they may <laughs> use some kind of freedom? Or would you say, oh, we can work together, like in the AGL OSPO, uh, to just share this and maybe do our lessons learned and training together? So what's mm. your thought on this? It's a good question. So in this case, it's not only open source champions, because when we def define the open source champions, it's mainly for support the compliance and the contribution work. For the collaboration area, like how we collaborate with uh, ELISA, AGL, etc. That needs each area's uh, specialist, I would say, to kind of analyze how these projects are engaged in Volvo cars and how we can benefit from each other. Uh, it's a win-win game here, and uh, uh, that is some open source champions are the software architect, for example. Of course, in this case, they can be involved, mm -hmm. but some are not. Like some open source champions are might from the kind of developer or CI part. Um, it, it differs. So as I said, how in your company, I mean, if you have already done this, you can share with us also how you kind of find this, let's say, the Linux part. Linux is very wide. Then embedded Linux. As you said, then safety Linux, right? And safety. So the scope is narrow and narrow. How you can find the correct person in your company, which is has the competence, both for from the technical and also the, with the collaboration. And also you need to form the internal work, work group. One person cannot convince all the same, peop, same managers, like we need to join this because of this. You, okay, thank you. You always needed to kind of have this business value as the first uh, uh, pitch. <clears throat> Thanks. I think we have a question here. Uh, so, yeah, so, about um, <laughs> Um, okay, just a, one uh, quick question, because I, I think it's very impressive that uh, women have uh, uh, been active in the OSPO activities, so I would like to understand what uh, your, um, uh, what do you think the women's power in this kind of OSPO or open source activities? Oh, for the work area, I never think it's, there's so, so much difference between women and men. Um, in, in my case, it's 
I, I came from engineer part. As I said, I was a DevOps engineer before. So I worked for Ericsson many years ago. Uh, purely engineer mindset, very direct. Uh, this is what we are going to do. We need to go do that. Uh, I just focus on the, the, the things more than others. I think once you focus, focus on correct things, put your time and energy on it, it will happen uh, sooner or later. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's, there's a good thing is <laughs> in a company, usually a lot of men and quite a few women in this technology area. Maybe that women can get more respect. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, uh, this is uh, time is up. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, after the direct <laughs> question, yes. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much.